meniscal injury and surgical treatment, meniscectomy and meniscus repair. Many thanks to the author, Kim Jin Gu. This video was created based on findings from the book cited below. Knee Arthroscopy, an up-to-date guide. Kim Jin Gu, ed. Springer, 2021. Meniscal tears are common injuries that may result in pain and functional limitation. Treatment options include benign neglect, rehabilitation, meniscectomy, and repair. Non-surgical care can be used for older patients with degenerative meniscal pathology. Meniscectomy remains a viable and successful intervention for pain relief and functional improvement for symptomatic meniscal tears in appropriately indicated patients. However, it results in an increase in contact stresses in the articular cartilage of the affected compartment, leading to osteoarthritis. Meniscus repair provides improved long-term outcomes, better clinical outcomes, and less degenerative changes compared with meniscectomy. Orthopedic surgeons should know the proper indications of meniscus repair and understand various techniques and surgical devices for the management of repairable meniscal tears. Innovative technology of biologic augmentation for better healing and tissue engineering for meniscal defects is currently developing, and they may help the management of complex meniscal tears in the future. The meniscus has an important biomechanical role in the normal function of the knee including load-bearing, shock absorption, and joint stability. The larger contact area provided by the meniscus reduces the average contact stress in the knee joint. The menisci thus prevent mechanical damage to articular cartilage. Tears of the meniscus are one of the common knee injuries and more than one third of people over the age of 50 years have meniscal pathology detectable on MRI. As orthopedic surgeons frequently encounter patients with asymptomatic or symptomatic meniscus tears, they should know the current evidence of non-operative, meniscectomy, and meniscus repair to determine the optimal treatment strategy. In this chapter, the author provides a practical guide about the management of meniscus tears and describes the arthroscopic techniques of meniscectomy and meniscus repair. A detailed, careful, systemic clinical evaluation is important to not only determine whether current symptoms and functional limitations resulting from a torn meniscus but also to select the most proper treatment between non-operative, meniscectomy, and repair. Disorders that can produce symptoms like those of a torn meniscus must be kept in mind to avoid misdiagnosis and improper treatment. A thorough history includes the presence of trauma, assessment of the injury mechanism, initial and current symptoms, pre-injury occupational and sports activity levels, and current functional limitations. The history of specific injury may not be obtained, especially when tears of abnormal or degenerative menisci have occurred. This scenario is noted most often in middle-aged patients who sustain a weight-bearing twist on the knee or who have pain after squatting. Tears of normal menisci usually are associated with more significant trauma or injury but are produced by a similar mechanism. The meniscus is entrapped between the femoral and tibial condyles in flexion, tearing as the knee is extended. Patients with tears in degenerative menisci may recall symptoms of mild catching, snapping, or clicking, as well as occasional pain and mild swelling in the joint. Once the tear in the meniscus becomes of significant size, more obvious symptoms of giving way and locking may develop. A comprehensive physical examination is performed, which includes the presence of swelling or effusion, knee range of motion, tibiofemoral joint line tenderness, diagnostic tests such as McMurray test, Apley test, squat test, ligament instability, muscle atrophy, and gait abnormalities. Plain radiographs including full standing lower limb, weight-bearing posterior anterior at 45 degrees of knee flexion, lateral at 30 degrees of knee flexion, and patellofemoral axial provide limb alignment, joint space narrowing, patellofemoral joint problems. Coronal lower limb alignment is measured using full standing hip knee ankle weight bearing radiographs in knees that demonstrate varus or valgus alignment. MRI provides not only information about meniscus tear types and integrity based on signal patterns but also concomitant ligament and articular cartilage injuries. 
However, the final decision between meniscectomy and repair is not made until the time of diagnostic arthroscopy in some patients. Treatment should be individualized in a shared decision-making process with the patient after the discussion about known outcomes. The patient's age, activity level, expectation, meniscus tear type, tear location, tear size, associated degenerative changes, concomitant other injuries, and the presence of malalignment are important considering factors when determining proper treatment. Symptomatic degenerative tears or tears with minimal healing potential are mostly treated with non-operative or meniscectomy. Meniscus repair should be considered when there is high possibility that the meniscus will heal and maintain function. Arthroscopic meniscectomy to manage the unstable meniscal tears with mechanical symptoms may be beneficial, especially in a patient who fails to respond to non-operative treatment. However, the available evidence suggests that surgical treatment should not be the first-line intervention for patients with meniscal tears who are in middle or old age. The ISCA Meniscus Consensus Project developed a decision algorithm for these patients. In painful knees in middle-aged subjects, plain radiographs should be taken in the first line. MRI is not indicated at this stage unless a diagnosis requiring complementary examination is suspected. Non-operative treatment is initiated, comprising physiotherapy and intraarticular injections. Only in case of failure at three months following non-operative treatment, MRI is performed to confirm the diagnosis of the degenerative meniscal lesion or otherwise, although it is still necessary to check that the lesion matches the symptoms. If radiographs and MRI show no signs of advanced osteoarthritis, and notably of meniscal extrusion or facing chondral edema, arthroscopy may be considered. On the other hand, osteoarthritis, when revealed, is to be treated in the first line, atheroscopic debridement showing no superiority. The presence of considerable mechanical symptoms constitutes a special case, in which early arthroscopic treatment may be indicated. Acute or chronic meniscal tears with infrequent or minimal symptoms can be treated with strengthening exercises and activity modification. Partial thickness tears or small stable, 1 cm long or less, less than 3 mm displacement from periphery, tears in vascular zone found during diagnostic arthroscopy, also can be treated non-operatively, if the knee is stable. However, the patient must be informed that any tear in the meniscus may not have healed, or symptoms recur despite strengthening exercise and activity modification. If symptoms recur or worsen after non-operative treatment, surgical treatment may be necessary. Operative treatment. Acute meniscal tears causing a locked knee or chronic tears with a superimposed acute meniscal injury in a patient with a history of symptomatic episodes such as catching, locking, and giving way are likely to require operative management. It is important to discuss with the patient the benefits, risks, and outcomes of meniscectomy and repair, as well as the rehabilitation program, time of return to daily activities, work, and sports. As activity restriction following meniscus repair takes longer when compared with meniscectomy, the surgeon should judge the willingness and the ability of the patient to comply with required postoperative restrictions. The patient is informed that the final procedure can be changed intraoperatively according to arthroscopic findings, and the rehabilitation program may require modification according to the final procedures performed. When meniscectomy is planned, displaced torn meniscal fragments are carefully identified by MRI, if taken, preoperatively to avoid insufficient resection intraoperatively, figure. In addition, surgeons should figure out which portion of the meniscus is resected or preserved to maintain meniscus function as possible. If a torn meniscus is potentially repairable, it is important to figure out what repair techniques are most proper and check all of the instruments available in the operating room. Indication A meniscectomy is indicated for acute or chronic irreparable meniscal tears causing recurrent symptoms and significant functional limitation, although an adequate non-operative treatment is performed for more than three months. Chronic displaceable vertical longitudinal or bucket handle tears, radial or oblique tears confined to white white or red white, and horizontal flap tears are common tears managed with meniscectomy, figure.
The patient should be informed that symptoms may not be resolved quickly, or residual symptoms may remain even after a well-performed meniscectomy. The patient is placed in the supine position on the operating table so that the affected leg is elevated. The knee is positioned distal to the edge in the table, allowing posterior medial or posterolateral access if the foot of the table is flexed or removed during the procedure. A tourniquet is placed on the proximal thigh and a lateral thigh post is set to apply a valgus stress to improve visualization of the medial compartment. The anterolateral portal is placed adjacent to the patella tendon 1 cm above the joint line and 1 cm lateral to the margin of the patella tendon. A 30 degrees arthroscope is gently inserted into the joint through the anterolateral portal with the knee in 70 degrees to 90 degrees degrees of flexion and then advanced towards suprapatellar pouch with the knee extended. A systematic examination is performed from the suprapatella pouch through the medial gutter, medial compartment, intercondylar notch, lateral compartment to lateral gutter. With the arthroscope focused in the medial compartment, the anteromedial portal is created with the aid of a spinal needle. Depending on the location of the meniscus tear, the anteromedial portal can be adjusted appropriately for easy access. Precise working portals are very important to resect the meniscus as planned and to avoid the damage of the articular cartilage by instruments. Too high anterior working portals make it difficult to access the posterior horn of the meniscus. After systemic examination of the knee joint, one palpates carefully the superior and inferior surface of the tear site of the meniscus using a probe to determine the type and extent of the meniscal tear and to find any displaced unstable meniscal fragment. Failures to classify accurately the extent, various planes of the tear and failure to find the displaced unstable meniscal fragments often results in insufficient resection or removing healthy meniscal tissue. If the medial compartment is too tight to view the posterior horn of the meniscus, release of the medial collateral ligament by pie crusting can increase the space of the medial compartment. To examine the posterior medial compartment, a 30 degrees arthroscope is advanced obliquely from the anterolateral portal through the intercondylar notch between the posterior cruciate ligament and the medial femoral condyle to the posterior medial compartment. If the gap between is the posterior cruciate ligament and the medial femoral condyle too narrow to advance, a valgus stress in a 30 degrees of knee flexion help advance the arthroscope. For examination of the posterolateral compartment, a 30 degrees arthroscope is advanced obliquely from the anteromedial portal through the intercondylar notch between the anterior cruciate ligament and the lateral femoral condyle to the posterolateral compartment. Usually, Introducing an arthroscope to posterolateral compartment is easier than posteromedial compartment. If the gap between the anterior cruciate ligament and the lateral femoral condyle is tight, the figure 4 position makes an arthroscope advance easier. With a 30 degrees arthroscope through anterior portals, it may be difficult to view around the posteromedial or posterolateral corner. Instead, a 70 degrees arthroscope through the anterior portals is useful for investigating around the posterior medial or posterolateral corner. Arthroscopic meniscectomy techniques. No standard techniques of meniscectomy are present, but the following principles are kept in mind. 1. Preserve the meniscus as much as possible to maintain its function. 2. Remove completely the unstable meniscal fragments causing symptoms and confirm there are no hidden tears before finishing the operation. 3. Frequently probe an edge of the meniscus during meniscectomy and leave a contoured, balanced, stable peripheral rim. Finally, 4. The instruments and the meniscus to be removed are always within the arthroscopic view to avoid damage or resection of normal healthy structures. 5. Use an accessory portal if needed. 6. Suction to remove any morselized meniscal fragments, which may cause synovitis later. Meniscectomy can be performed either with one piece resection of the large, mobile fragments such as displaceable large bucket handle tears or bit by bit resection of the non or partially displaceable small to medium sized meniscal fragments such as small longitudinal tears, horizontal flap tears, incomplete radial tears, and complex tears. Small mobile meniscus fragments also can be removed by a motorized shaver. 
If one piece resection of bucket handle tear is planned, resection of the posterior attachment first is preferable, because the meniscal fragment can be displaced in the posterior compartment after anterior resection and a large floating meniscal fragment in the intercondylar notch can limit an arthroscope and basket forceps access to the posterior attachment. An accessory anterior portal may be useful to grab and pull the displaceable meniscal fragment during resecting the anterior or posterior attachment through a standard portal. This also prevents the meniscus from floating freely during resection of the meniscus attachment. For horizontal flap tears or complex tears, surgeons should probe the tear site of the meniscus carefully to find any flap fragment. A flap often comes from the inferior leaf, and it can be rolled up under the meniscus or inverted behind the femoral condyle figure. When a flap fragment is displaced in the posterior compartment, additional posteromedial or posterolateral portals may be required to remove. The superior and the inferior leaves are resected back to a stable peripheral rim. When the horizontal tears in the anterior horn are resected, inframeniscal portals or a joystick technique can be useful to remove torn inferior leaves of the anterior horn, because the basket forceps or a shaver is difficult to reach the anterior horn through the anterior portals, figure 4. Incomplete radial tears, mostly occurs at the midbody or posterior horn of the lateral meniscus, can be resected a bit by bit by basket forceps to the endpoint of a tear. It should be careful not to over the anterior and posterior portion of the meniscus during balancing and contouring the rim. Clinical outcomes following meniscectomy are dependent on multiple factors. Current studies suggest that many patients with a high pre-injury activity level, younger age, medial meniscectomy, and smaller meniscal resection are more likely to return successfully to activities and sports following partial meniscectomy, although not always at their pre-injury level of activity. Improved clinical outcomes can be expected for male patients without obesity who are undergoing medial meniscectomy with minimal meniscal resection. Varus or valgus deformities, pre-existing degenerative changes in the knee, and anterior cruciate ligament deficiency negatively influence outcomes following meniscectomy. Failure rates following meniscectomy are relatively low compared with meniscal repair and discoid sorcerization, although revision rates are increased in patients undergoing lateral meniscectomy. Meniscectomy increases the risk of developing knee osteoarthritis, OA, particularly in female patients with obesity who undergo large meniscal resection and with that so does the risk of progressing to TKA. Meniscus Repair Indications The best indications for meniscal repair are a traumatic vertical longitudinal tear or bucket handle tear in the vascular zone of the meniscus, and meniscal capsular junction tear, ramp lesion, concomitant with an acute ACL tear, figure 5. A radial tear that extends to the periphery of the meniscus and horizontal tears in young patients also can be considered. A lower rate of healing is expected in a tear that is located at the white-white zone. Patient factors including age, activity level, rehabilitation potential, limb alignment, ligament stability, and degenerative changes of the joint also must be considered. Arthroscopic repair technique. Arthroscopic repair techniques include the inside-out, outside-in, and all-inside techniques. The inside-out or outside-in meniscus technique is still used by many surgeons to repair the torn meniscus, whereas all-inside repair devices are becoming much more popular currently as the result of their ease of use. Regardless of the repair techniques, there are important principles for successful healing. 1. Consider patient factors age, activity, expectation, willingness for rehabilitation, 2, tear debridement and local abrasion to stimulate a healing response, and, 3, meticulous suture placement to reduce anatomically and stabilize the meniscus during healing process. The inside-out technique is traditionally considered the gold standard for the meniscus tears involving the middle thirds and or the posterior horn. The advantages of this technique are the precise placement of sutures in various configurations, vertical, horizontal, oblique, cross. However, there is a risk of neurovascular injuries, so an additional posteromedial or posterolateral exposure is required to protect the neurovascular structures when repairing the posterior horn tears. 22. 
for inside out repair, various angled zone specific suture cannulas, figure 6, and a 10 inch flexible straight double arm needle attached with 2 to 0 braided non absorbable sutures are required. A valgus, with 20 to 30 degree of knee flexion, or varus stress, usually figure 4 position, helps open the medial or lateral compartment to access the posterior horn. A 30 o arthroscope is inserted through the anterolateral or anteromedial portal according to the tear site. The zone specific suture cannula is introduced through the anterolateral or anteromedial portal and pointed to the exact location of suture placement. A radius of suture cannula should be not only large enough to angle the needle away from the neurovascular structures posteriorly but also pass the needle through the tear vertically. Occasionally, the tibial spines block access for the suture cannula and an accessory portal may be required. If a tear involves the posterior horn beyond the posteromedial corner, in this case, the author prefers all inside repair using a suture passer hook through the posteromedial portal. A posteromedial exposure is needed to protect the neurovascular structures. Figure A. A 3 to 4 cm vertical skin incision is made over the posteromedial aspect of the knee and then the interval between the medial head of the gastrocnemius and the posterior capsule is identified. A retractor is placed in this interval to protect the neurovascular structures and to help to capture the needles. The tip of the cannula is placed in a fashion that the needle enters the inner side of a torn meniscus 3 to 4 mm from the torn edge. The second assistant passes a 10 inch flexible needle through the cannula, aiming the needle in a slightly vertical direction to exit a tore above the center of the torn edge. The first assistant catches the needle with the needle holder as it exits through the capsule. The second needle is passed in the same manner to penetrate the outer side of a torn meniscus or directly meniscosynovial capsule, forming a vertical suture that provides better holding strength than a horizontal suture. The first assistant catches the double-armed needles and pulls the suture through. Both needles are cut, and the paired sutures are clamped together with a hemostat. To avoid the lift up of the meniscus, the vertical divergent sutures are placed from both the superior and inferior surface of the meniscus alternatively every 3 to 5 mm figure. If the tear involves mainly the middle third of the medial meniscus, the posteromedial exposure is not needed in most cases. Instead, a 1 to 2 cm incision is made directly over the needle tip coming from the joint, before passing the sutures through the skin to avoid cutting the suture during making an incision. When all sutures are passed out, they are tied over the capsule. If the capsule is not exposed completely, sutures may be tied over the subcutaneous tissue. This may lead to an insufficient reduction of the tear site. The surgeon closely observes the reduction of the meniscus body and closure of the tear site with passage and tying of the vertical divergent sutures. The articular cartilage is carefully protected to avoid damage during the procedures. For lateral meniscus repairs, the surgeon should frequently check the direction of the suture needle to always ensure that it angles away from the perineal nerve. The perineal nerve moves more inferiorly with 90 degrees of knee flexion and less likely to be injured. If the tear involves the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus, the posterolateral corner is exposed. A 3 to 4 cm vertical skin incision is made just behind the lateral collateral ligament and dissected. The interval between the iliotibial band and the biceps femoris tendon is identified and dissected. The interval between the lateral gastrocnemius and the posterolateral capsule is opened bluntly, just proximal to the fibula head. A retractor is placed in this interval to push the neurovascular bundle posterolaterally, figure B. The retractor prevents the suture needles from potentially injuring the common perineal nerve. Other technical details of the lateral meniscus repair are the same as the medial meniscus repair. After diagnostic arthroscopy, an 18 gauge spinal needle is introduced from outside to identify the exact point of a meniscus tear. A small skin incision is made at the entry point of a spinal needle and the capsule is exposed after dissection. The first spinal needle is introduced from outside through the capsule to inside, penetrating the inner side of a torn meniscus in a vertical orientation from superior to the inferior surface or vice versa. Figure. The stylet is removed, 
and a suture, PDS0, is passed through the spinal needle into the joint. The free end of the first suture inside the joint is taken out through an anteromedial or anterolateral portal and the first spinal needle is withdrawn. A second spinal needle is introduced through the same skin incision and entered through the outer side of a torn meniscus or just above or below the meniscus surface. The stylet is removed, and a shuttle relay wire, or different colored second suture, is passed through the spinal needle into the joint. The free end of the shuttle relay wire, or different colored second suture, is taken out through the same anterior portal and a second spinal needle is removed. A free end of the first suture is hooked to the shuttle relay system, or tie first and second suture together, and carried across the meniscus or capsule by pulling the shuttle relay, or a different colored second suture. Both free ends of the first suture on the outside are tied over the capsule. Same procedures are repeated to stabilize the meniscus tear firmly if needed. When the outside and directed needle cannot be controlled adequately to place the sutures along with the exact point of the meniscus, the suture passer hook based modified techniques is helpful for better placement of vertical sutures at the exact point. Figure Thompson et al. also introduced the simple method of suture retrieval when the special instruments are not available in the operating room. Figure a 21 gauge needle with a suture loop, permission from arthroscopy techniques, volume 3, number 2, April, 2014, PPE 233E235, Fig 1. Neurovascular risks and additional posterior exposure with the inside out repair technique and limited access to tears in the posterior third of the meniscus with the outside in technique have developed fully arthroscopic all inside repair techniques. The first generation all inside meniscal repair was a suture passer hook based repair through the posteromedial or posterolateral portal, but their technical difficulties led to the development of all inside meniscus devices. Advantages of all inside meniscal repair devices include the technical ease of insertion, no need for secondary incisions, decreased operative times, and no need for the trained assistants. However, implant related problems such as misfire, breakage, migration, and entrapment of the muscle, tendon, ligaments can occur during the procedures. 1. All inside repair using a suture passer hook. A suture passer hook technique enables various suture orientation, vertical, horizontal, oblique, cross. So, it is useful for specific tears, including ramp lesions, radial tears, and posterior root tears. These suture passer hooks are curved, leftward or rightward, to a greater or lesser degree. Arthroscopic technique for a longitudinal tear at the posterior horn of the medial meniscus in red red zone. This technique is well described by Onet Al. A 30 degrees arthroscope is advanced from the anterolateral portal through an intercondylar notch between the medial femoral condyle and the posterior cruciate ligament to the posteromedial compartment. A standard posteromedial portal is made under direct arthroscopic visualization. Using a probe through a posteromedial portal, the extent of tear is assessed. A 30 degrees arthroscope is switched to 70 degrees arthroscope, which provides a wider view of posteromedial corner. A curved suture passer hook loaded with a PDS0, Ethicon, Somayaville, New Jersey, USA is inserted from the posteromedial portal. The tip of the suture passer hook first penetrates the capsular tissue from superior to inferior direction. After confirming the tip of the suture passer hook penetrating the full layer of the capsule, the tip of the suture passer hook enters the meniscus from inferior to superior surface, figure. The suture is then fed through the lumen of the cannulated hook and taken out through the same posteromedial portal using a suture retriever. Sliding or non-sliding knot ties made and placed at the capsular side, capsular suture limb post. Additional sutures are placed by same procedures depending on the tear size. When it is difficult that a suture passer hook can be penetrated in a single step from the capsule to the meniscus, a two-step technique using a shuttle relay method is recommended. Figure. A first suture passer hook loaded with a PDS0 penetrates from inferior surface to superior surface of the meniscus and a free end of the suture inside is retrieved through the posteromedial portal. 
a second suture pass a hook loaded with a shuttle relay wire, or a different colored second suture, then enter the capsule from superior to inferior direction. After a shuttle relay, or a different colored second suture, is fed through the lumen of the cannulated hook, a shuttle relay, or a different colored second suture, is retrieved through the same posteromedial portal. A free end of suture out of inferior surface of the meniscus is hooked to the relay system, or tie first and second suture together, and carried across the capsule by pulling a shuttle relay, or a different colored second suture. The next procedures are the same as described above. A posteromedial cannula may be useful for managing sutures and tying knots to avoid soft tissue entrapment. Figure 2. All inside meniscal repair devices. Currently, fourth generation all inside devices are available. They are flexible and suture based devices and allow for variable compression and retensioning across the tear. The surgeon should know the specific features of each device including possible suture configuration, mode of deployment, location of knots, and tensioning method. The Fast Fix 360 Meniscal Repair System, Smith & Nephew, Andover, Massachusetts, USA, consists of two implants, polyetherethacetone, peak, attached with a pre-tied, self-sliding, non-absorbable 2-0 ultra-braid TM suture. This device uses an active deployment system by a spring-assisted button with a 360 degrees design that allows for deployment of any hand position. The active deployment devices have less misfiles as compared with the passive deployment devices. The delivery needles are available in curved, straight, and reverse curved designs. After diagnostic arthroscopy and meniscal tear site preparation, the desired length limit of the delivery needle is determined using the meniscal depth probe. The tip of the probe is placed at the meniscosynovial junction and the width of the meniscus at the desired entry point for the delivery needle is measured. In the average size knee, a depth of 14 to 16 mm is usually adequate. Arthroscopic call inside technique using the Fast Fix 360, Smith & Nephew, Andover, Massachusetts, USA. For a longitudinal tear of the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus, figure. The depth penetration limiter to the desired length by pressing the depth limiter button is adjusted. The slotted cannula can be used to help position the tip of the delivery needle at the desired location and avoid soft tissue entrapment. The delivery needle is introduced into the joint with the tip down against the slotted cannula and inserted into the capsular side of the meniscus, for a vertical mattress suture repair. The deployment slider is pushed forward all the way to deploy the first implant. Proper deployment is accompanied by a clicking sound. The delivery needle is withdrawn from the meniscus slowly, keeping the needle inside the joint. The delivery needle is positioned at least 5 mm from the tear site of the inner side meniscus and advanced until the depth penetration limiter contacts the surface of the meniscus. The deployment slider is forwarded all the way to deploy the second implant, should be accompanied by clicking sound. The delivery needle is withdrawn from the joint after deployment of the second implant. The free end of the suture is pulled to advance the sliding knot and reduce the meniscus. It is normal to encounter firm resistance as the knot is snugged down. It is important to pull the free end of the suture directly perpendicular to the tear site. The tension is applied slowly and steadily to the suture to cinch the knot down. The knot is further tightened to compress the tear site using a knot pusher slash suture cutter and the suture is cut by pushing the trigger forward. Because of the high strength of the suture, using a small arthroscopic basket punch or scissors to cut the suture often results in the tail of the suture being frayed. The sutures can be placed alternatively on the inferior surface of the meniscus to reduce the puckering of the meniscus using the reverse curved delivery needle. If the remaining tissue of the capsular side meniscus is not sufficient for vertical mattress suture, sutures are placed in a horizontal mattress orientation. A minimum width of 8 mm between the two insertion points is recommended. Menisco capsular junction longitudinal tear, ramp lesion The meniscus ramp lesion is a longitudinal tear at the menisco capsular junction of the medial meniscus posterior horn and frequently occurs at the time of ACL injuries, figure 16. A ramp lesion is reported to increase rotatory instability in ACL injured knees, and it is considered to be repaired. 
Several arthroscopic repair techniques for a ramp lesion have been introduced. The author recommends to use a suture pass air hook based all inside repair through a posterior medial portal, which allows for placement of vertical sutures perpendicular to deep fibers of the meniscus. Technical details are the same as described above. Three popliteromeniscal fascicles, antero inferior, posterior superior, postero inferior, which combined with the popliteus tendon form a peripheral attachment to the lateral meniscus at the popliteal hiatus of the knee. Injuries to meniscotibial attachment including popliteromeniscal fascicles at the posterolateral aspect of the lateral meniscus lead to pain and hypermobile lateral meniscus. Hypermobile lateral meniscus should be clinically suspected in patients with lateral or posterolateral knee pain and or locking symptoms with squatting or figure 4 position. As MRI reveals no pathologic findings in most cases, it can be undiagnosed. At diagnostic arthroscopy, popliteal meniscal fascicles tears are suspected when there are enlarged popliteal hiatus with attenuation or tearing of the meniscus attachments, or subluxation of the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus by a probe or superior lift of the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus, figure. Arthroscopic viewing the lateral gutter through the anterolateral portal using 30 degrees arthroscope and posterolateral compartment through the anteromedial portal using 70 degrees arthroscope can help assess the extent of peripheral attachment tear. Several authors have reported satisfactory outcomes following arthroscopic repair of peripheral attachment at the posterolateral aspect of the lateral meniscus. Multiple vertical sutures should be placed on either side of the popliteus tendon to reduce the lateral meniscus posterior horn to a normal tibial position and restore the meniscus attachments. The repair technique is the same manner as previously described lateral meniscus repair using inside out or outside in or all inside techniques according to the surgeon's preference. In chronic cases, posterolateral synovial tissue is frequently found to be thin and redundant. The repair can be reinforced by placing sutures into meniscus tissue through the popliteus tendon to posterolateral capsule. A traumatic radial tear occurs more commonly at the midbody or near the posterior root of the lateral meniscus. Radial tears confined to the white-white or red-white zone may not be suitable for repair, because it is unlikely to heal due to poor blood supply. However, an acute complete radial tear extending to red red zone or the meniscocapsular junction should be repaired, because it compromises the hoop tension of the meniscus. The goal of repair for a complete radial tear is to preserve meniscus function partially, because it is less likely to have successful healing of a tear in the white white or red white zone of the meniscus. Sutures can be placed on either side of the tear using an all inside, suture hook, or all inside devices, outside in, or inside out techniques according to the surgeon's preference, figure. Only two to four sutures can be placed for a radial tear, so the holding strength of the suture may be a concern. So, non-weight bearing for four to six weeks is recommended to prevent disruption of the repair site. Several techniques have been introduced recently to overcome the low holding strength. Wu et al. Reported satisfactory clinical outcomes at a mean 3.5 year follow up. Fibrin clots also can be useful for the enhancement of healing in the white white or red white zone of radial tears of the lateral meniscus. Occasionally, the edges of the chronic radial tear are degenerative with a wide gap. Due to poor suture holding capability, the meniscus tear edges may progress to separate, and poorly organized fibrous tissue replaces the gap during the healing process. Occasionally, a horizontal tear with good meniscus tissue quality is encountered in young patients. Traditionally, symptomatic horizontal tears that do not respond to non-operative treatment are managed with meniscectomy. However, repair of horizontal meniscal tears is proven to be biomechanically advantageous to partial meniscectomy, so repair can be considered in young patients. A number of repair techniques for horizontal tears have been introduced and vertical sutures with fibrin clots or platelet rich plasm have shown successful healing and satisfactory clinical outcomes. Figure. However, a higher complication rate of meniscus repair for horizontal tears is also warranted compared to meniscectomy.
Intraarticular suture and knots may be abrasive to chondral surfaces when arthroscopic haul inside devices are used through anterior portals. For grade 2 horizontal tears, intrameniscal, arthroscopic or open repair is required through posteromedial approach. Detailed surgical techniques are referred to relevant references. Biologic augmentation for meniscus healing. Biologic augmentation can enhance the repair process of meniscus tears that extend limited vascular zones of the meniscus. The abrasion at meniscosynovial junction or a microfracture, or drilling, in the intercondylar notch region is simply performed to produce bleeding that promotes adherence of fibrin clots at the repair site. An exogenous fibrin clot is also prepared and inserted at the repair site. The exact mechanism of a fibrin clot is unknown, but it is expected that it may provide chemotactic and mitogenic stimuli. Biologic augmentation for meniscus healing. When anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction is performed concomitantly, successful healing of meniscus repair is expected without biologic augmentation. Case reports or small cases series have reported that platelet-rich plasma or stem cells application provides excellent healing, so they are a promising option for complex meniscus tears. However, clinical application is limited yet due to cost, time and the need of special equipment or facilities. Further clinical studies are required to determine whether they are superior to an exogenous fibrin or abrasion, microfracture. Thanks for watching my video. Do not forget to subscribe to my non-profit channel.